We are very pleased to have with us today Natasha Stenbach, all the way from San Diego, California. She'll be teaching lesson number one, weather concepts. Now, Natasha is not only a pilot, she's a meteorologist. She's the weather anchor for Channel 8 KFMB TV, a CBS affiliate in San Diego. Uh, she's earned her BA in telecommunications from the University of Pepperdine, or Pepperdine University, and she's a member of the American Meteorological Society. Now, besides her strong interest in meteorology, Natasha is a big fan and has been involved in aviation her entire life. Her father, of course, Bank Stenbach, a longtime commercial pilot, and her uncle, Roger Stenbach, owner of Stenbach Communications, has been teaching aspiring student pilots for more than 30 years. Again, welcome, Natasha. We appreciate you being here. Thank you very much, Matt. Listen, San Diego, it's got to be a fun city, a great place to fly. It is a fun city, but yeah, a great place for VFR pilots. But you know, sometimes we get that marine layer, so it's really important to have that instrument rating. Outstanding. Now, you've got a long list of things in lesson number one. What are you going to cover? Yeah, sure enough, Matt. Well, basically, I'm really excited about presenting the weather lessons in this ground school course. In this lesson, we'll talk about what influences weather, what causes it, how it behaves and how it affects you as a pilot. It's important for you to recognize signs of weather changes, cloud formations and conditions favorable to aircraft icing. Once you've learned the basic weather principles, you'll learn how to avoid the troublesome weather for safe and smooth flying. In this lesson, weather fundamentals. We'll talk about what influences weather, what causes it, how it behaves, and how it affects you as a pilot. Now, it's important for you to recognize signs of weather changes, cloud formations, and conditions favorable to aircraft icing. Once you've learned the basic weather principles, you'll learn how to avoid the troublesome weather spots for safe and smooth flying. Now, throughout this weather course for aviators, we'll cover these topics. What is weather? Circulation and wind. Temperature and moisture. Atmospheric stability. Clouds. Air masses fronts, thunderstorms, turbulence, airframe icing, and the jet stream. Okay, for our first topic, what is weather? Let's join Natasha in the classroom. Hi, I'm Natasha Stenbach, your instructor for this lesson covering weather fundamentals. Because weather is one of the most important factors in flight safety, this lesson covers a great deal more detail than what you need to know to pass the FAA Instrument Knowledge Test. We'll cover enough detail for you to decide with confidence whether to operate VFR, IFR, or make the go, no-go decision. With that in mind, let's begin. Weather is the state of the atmosphere at any given time, day or night. And you know, weather, it's a complex subject. The atmosphere is constantly in motion as it tries to reach a point in equilibrium. Weather influences our daily lives and routines and has a profound effect on all our aviation activities. So let's talk a moment about the role weather plays in our aviation activities and how it affects our personal minimums. The FAA uses the acronym PAVE to help pilots develop a personal minimums guide. PAVE stands for Pilot, Aircraft, Environment, and external pressures. So when considering the minimums to evaluate a pilot's readiness to operate as PIC, consider physical condition, competency, and training. Next, consider the aircraft. Is it airworthy, properly equipped, and suitable for the intended mission? Will it safely handle forecast weather with adequate performance margins? When evaluating the environment, consider all relevant weather conditions. Is the weather forecast improving or deteriorating? What about daylight and or night operations? What are the probabilities of icing, turbulence, strong winds, and low visibility? Finally, consider any external pressures affecting you. Do you need to arrive at a certain time? Is time available to alter your flight should you encounter weather or aircraft problems? Are there personal or professional pressures affecting your performance and judgment? Careful considerations of these PAVE factors will ensure a safe and enjoyable flight. Okay, let's get into the details of weather fundamentals. With us in the studio today is Dave Seleski for the lesson on weather. Dave, welcome. Thanks much, Matt. A little background on Dave. If you've ever taken an ASA virtual test prep ground school course, you'll be familiar with Dave's charm and expertise. <laughs> now, he has a degree in communications and broadcast meteorology from Mississippi State. 
Dave also brings a unique perspective to the table. Not only is he an accomplished pilot, a commercial pilot by the way, with extensive owner-operator experience in the real world of aviation, he's also a very seasoned, pun intended, meteorologist. You say I'm old? Well, he's uh, for the I'm NBC old. affiliate in Portland, Oregon. Now he's been a, a weather anchor there for News Channel 8 for more than 21 years bringing Oregonians the weather forecast they either expect, rain most of the time, or really appreciate warm and sunny days. Well, be that as it may, while the rest of the country believes it always rains in Oregon, real Oregonians <laughs> know that the Pacific Northwest weather is actually quite unpredictable. True. And is challenging for both meteorologists and pilots alike. Dave loves aviation and how the weather impacts each flight, and it will come out in his answers to our questions. Dave, again, welcome. Thanks, Matt. Well, Dave, is weather really affected by geographical location? Yes, and you can look at what's going on across the country. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we have what is the biggest weather-making machine on the planet, and that's the Pacific Ocean, uh, steering moisture into the Northwest. We also have a couple of mountain ranges, the Coast Range and the Cascades, and that helps determine what kind of precipitation, whether liquid or frozen, we're going to be looking at here in the Northwest. In the Midwest, you get east of the Rockies, you have what's called a continental air mass. It's dry, very warm, and in a matter of hours can become very humid and kick off these big, 50, 60,000 foot high thunderstorms that we're also familiar with that occur in the summer and early fall months in the Midwest. And then on the East Coast, they are under the influence of the Atlantic Ocean and also the Canadian Maritime Provinces, and that presents a whole different set of problems and issues for pilots on the East Coast. We'll begin with the atmosphere. Surprisingly, oxygen is not the single biggest component of the atmosphere. In fact, nitrogen makes up about 78% of the atmosphere, followed by oxygen at 21%, and then other gases like helium and argon at about 1% of the atmosphere. A cubic foot of the atmosphere contains anywhere from zero to about 4% water vapor. You'll hear mention of the standard atmosphere throughout your aviation weather studies. Continual fluctuations of temperature and pressure in our atmosphere create problems for engineers and meteorologists who require a fixed standard of reference. The atmosphere fluctuates continuously as it tries to reach equilibrium in pressure, temperature, and humidity. The standard atmosphere is an average condition of all these fluctuations. It is the standard for calibrating the pressure, altimeter, and developing aircraft performance data. Here's a handy weather fact. The standard sea level pressure is 29.92 inches of mercury, or about 1,013 millibars. The standard sea level temperature is 59 degrees Fahrenheit, or 15 degrees Celsius. The standard rate of change in pressure is about one inch of mercury per 1,000 foot gain in altitude. In the troposphere, pressure decreases as you increase in altitude. Or simply stated, the further you go up, the more the barometer drops. To calculate ISA, use the average lapse rate of two degrees Celsius per thousand feet. Meteorologists look at the atmosphere like you would a layer cake. There are several different layers to the atmosphere from the bottom up. The atmosphere consists of the troposphere and the stratosphere, the mesosphere, and the very top layer is the thermosphere. Virtually all aviation weather takes place in the bottom two layers. The troposphere ranges anywhere from the Earth's surface to 20,000 feet near the North and South Poles, whereas at the equator it ranges from the surface to 65,000 feet. The tropopause separates the troposphere from the stratosphere. The stratosphere is typified by relatively small changes in temperature with height, except for some warming right near the very top. In addition to wind, this unequal heating also causes variation in pressure and altimeter settings between weather reporting points. So let's talk about what causes weather. Well, the major source of all weather is the sun. All weather is caused by a change in temperature. The earth is constantly being warmed and cooled at an uneven rate. The earth is heated by the sun, which is about 93 million miles away. Again, that heating is not being done at an even rate. Near the poles, you have a greater surface area that's being heated, so it's not going to heat as rapidly as the smaller surface area near the equator. 
But at the equator, all this energy from the sun is concentrated on a lower surface area on the planet, thus heating the equatorial regions more than the higher and lower latitudes. The seasons also greatly affect the planet's heating and cooling balance. The Earth is tilted about 23 degrees on its axis. In the summer, the northern hemisphere receives most of the heat energy. But as the Earth orbits the sun, the southern hemisphere warms up during the northern hemisphere winter because the northern hemisphere presents a greater surface area for heating. So it's not being heated up as much as at the equator where it's getting more direct energy from the sun. This cycle repeats each year. While the Earth orbit is not perfectly circular, the cooling and heating is not influenced much by the slight fluctuation of the distance between the Sun and the Earth. Here is a close-up of the summer in the Northern Hemisphere and again of the winter in the Northern Hemisphere. This unequal heating of the Earth's atmosphere is what creates wind. The warmer low pressure air has a tendency to rise and the colder high pressure air has a tendency to settle or descend. There are a number of factors that affect how an area heats up. The angle of the sun's rays has the greatest effect on temperature. Types of cloud cover, low stratified clouds influence heating more than high cirrus clouds do. Land changes heating characteristics more than water. Deserts and barren areas change temperature much more rapidly than, say, a forest or a farmer's field. And we already discussed the effect of the seasons. Summer produces greater temperature variation than winter does. Welcome back to the studio. Now, after each topic, you'll be given some review questions and an opportunity to answer them. I'll provide you with the correct answer. If you need additional time before I give you the answer, go ahead and pause the lesson. All right, here's your first question. The primary cause of all changes in the Earth's weather is which of these three, A, B, or C? Your answer is A. Every physical process of weather is accompanied by or is the result of a heat exchange. Differences in solar energy create temperature variations. These Temperature variations create forces that drive the atmosphere in its endless motion. Okay, simple enough. All right, let's move along. Another topic. Circulation and wind. Back to your classroom and your instructor. Next up is circulation and wind. Global circulation is what's needed to make the weather go around. Check this out. Hot air rises, but it's a little more complicated than just that. Hot air rising is referred to as convection. In a simplified model, if the Earth didn't rotate, convection would cause cold air at the poles to descend down towards the equator, then rise by convection and cool and descend toward the poles. Well, the Earth, as we all know, does rotate on its axis, and that sets up what is called a three-cell circulation pattern. The three cells are the polar, the feral, and the Hadley cell. You have colder air that moves down from the poles toward warmer regions, rises or convex through the polar, the feral, and the Hadley cell. This causes a change in pressure and also creates winds in the atmosphere. To measure these pressure changes, we use a pressure pattern map. These lines are called isobars. They show constant lines of pressure in the atmosphere. Think of these isobars as stairs moving up or down in the atmosphere. To get down, we follow a trough line down towards the atmosphere to our lowest point. Same thing holds true for higher pressure or staircases shown by this ridge line going up to reach our highest point in the atmosphere. The closer the isobars are together, the stronger the wind speeds. Because the Earth rotates, this large, simple air cell circulation pattern is greatly distorted by a phenomenon known as the Coriolis force. This effect on air circulation is caused by the Earth's rotation. Imagine the rotation of a disk. I want to draw a line straight out right here but suppose I suddenly stop the CD. 
Instead of going straight out, the line actually curves down towards the right. Here, let's check it out one more time. The Coriolis effect is most noticeable near the poles and least noticeable near the equator. And here is another illustration of the Coriolis force. Note the flight path of the three airplanes. There is a difference in curvature between destination A, destination B, and destination C. Now, here's how it affects the general circulation of the atmosphere. That Coriolis force turns the air currents to the right. This is the low-level circulation pattern. Note the polar easterlies, the prevailing westerlies, and trade winds. Now, here are the general global winds. Note the Polar, Feral, and Hadley circulation. Also, note the semi-permanent high and low pressure areas, as well as the prevailing winds shown here. Now, here's a typical summertime weather map. High pressure on the east coast. Higher pressure on the west coast from about 30 to 60 degrees north latitude. So, on a typical winter pressure pattern map, you'll notice that Colder air pushes this ridge of high pressure down a little bit towards the south, but they're still there, 365 days a year, seven days a week. Now let's talk about how this global circulation pattern results in winds and local breezes. We'll talk first about wind in the upper atmosphere. Now check the winds aloft depiction. We talked about high pressure and low pressure. Here are the isobars which show steps to and from low and high pressure. Now these isobars can also be thought of as pressure gradient force. A pressure gradient force acts to move air parcels from high pressure to low pressure. The pressure gradient force acts as right angles to the isobars. Isobars that are close together indicate a strong pressure gradient. In the upper atmosphere, pressure gradient force and the Coriolis effect are equal, which means Wind direction does not flow from high to low, but rather along or parallel to the isobars. Now, at the surface, it's a little different story. We have a new force called friction. Now, friction results as winds flow near the surface of the atmosphere, over mountains, and through valleys. This changes the speed and wind direction and also changes the strength of the Coriolis force right here, and that allows a more direct path of our wind or resulting wind to go from high to low at about a 45 degree angle along those isobars. Now, notice on this map how the wind from the high pressure to the low pressure does not flow directly into that low. Rather, it takes a different route counterclockwise moving into the center of low pressure. Air flows counterclockwise around low pressure areas, and clockwise around high pressure areas. Now, in the upper atmosphere, the wind does not flow directly into the area of low pressure. Coriolis and pressure gradient force cause the wind to move along the isobars and take a path along this direction parallel to those isobars. At the surface, the flow of air between high and low pressure in combination with the Coriolis effect pressure gradient force and friction of the earth creates a flow pattern like the one you see here. Now, prevailing winds can be described this way. Winds move from high to low pressure modified by Coriolis effect and terrain friction. Cold air is replacing warm air in circulation patterns. Global wind patterns cause the earth's overall weather, but localized wind patterns are much more important to pilots. Local weather patterns are caused by the very same forces that cause global wind patterns. Now, sea breeze circulation is a good example of how this works. Our classic closed cell circulation pattern causes sea breeze and wind breeze circulation patterns, typically in late morning and afternoon hours. Higher pressure develops offshore and lower pressure onshore. This is because the ocean does not heat or cool as rapidly as the landmass does. 
As a result, you'll get cooler air, denser air, creating a higher pressure over the ocean. Now, since the landmass heats up more rapidly than the ocean, it contains less dense air and lower pressure on shore. This causes this classic circulation pattern of high pressure flow into lower pressure, resulting in warm rising circulation. This is the closed circulation cell pattern. Now, the land breeze at night has just the opposite effect since the landmass cools much more rapidly than the ocean. Denser, cooler, high pressure air develops over the landmass. This air flows offshore over the ocean where it's warmed, rises, and returns. Again, it's the closed cell circulation pattern, and in some cases, winds from land breezes and sea breezes can reach speeds of about 10 to 25 miles per hour. Their effects may be felt as high as 2,000 feet over the surface. Now, here's what's known as a valley breeze. Air currents are moving uphill, typically in the afternoon. It's warmer air up here because it's less vegetated and the air is a little less dense as you gain altitude. Denser air down here in the more forested area warms rapidly. You have this denser air up here flowing to less dense air up on the mountain slope, creating this upslope wind effect here. Wind speeds may reach about 20 to 25 miles per hour in the mid to late afternoon hours. Now, a mountain breeze at night is just the opposite. The higher elevations cool more rapidly than in the valley floor. As a result, downslope winds or mountain breezes develop. Cold downslope winds are also known as catabatic winds. Higher pressure over mountains or glaciers have denser, much colder air. This air flows off the glaciers, off these icy snow fields, and down into the valley floor. Notice they heat up a little. Note the temperature is zero in the valley and near the summit, it's 25 degrees below zero. Now, warm downslope winds are a potentially dangerous situation for pilots. Typically, very strong winds are flowing over mountain peaks. They can be denoted by standing lenticular or lens type clouds. As these very strong winds roll over the mountain peaks, they drop down on the backside of the mountains as that colder air, which is much denser up here, begins to drop down. It actually compresses as it moves down into the atmosphere. It heats up because the air is compressed as it drops down to the valley floor. Some of these wind speeds can reach upwards of 100 miles an hour on the backside of a mountain range and are potentially very dangerous winds in which to fly. Okay, well, how do winds what role do winds play in IFR operations? Simply, you're going to have to know what kind of course correction you're going to have as you're flying along. Also, fuel consumption. The more of a headwind you're going to have, the longer it's going to take you to get from point A to point B, which means you're going to be burning more fuel. So we will have enough fuel to get to your original destination. And if you can't because you have low IFR conditions, do you have enough fuel to get to your alternate? Here's a nugget of weather uh, wisdom. A land breeze circulation flows out to the sea and occurs at night. Valley breezes occur during the day and in the mountains and are upslope winds. A catabatic wind is any descending wind caused by inclines or mountains. These winds consist of either cold or warm air and in some cases they can reach speeds in excess of 100 knots. A sea breeze circulation is an onshore flow and occurs mainly during the day. Back in the studio again for another FAA test question. What relationship exists between the winds at 2,000 feet above the surface and the surface winds? A, B, or C? Your answer in this case is B. Close to the Earth, wind direction is modified by the contours over which it passes, and wind speed is reduced by friction with the surface. Also, the winds at the surface are at an angle across the isobars due to the stronger pressure gradient. At levels 2,000 feet above the surface, the speed is greater, and the direction is usually parallel to the isobars. Okay. 
Very good. Moving on to another topic. This time, temperature and moisture. Back into the classroom for that topic. Next up, we'll cover temperature and moisture. First, we'll study humidity and dew point and why these are important to pilots. Water evaporates into the air. Water vapor is in most cases invisible, like oxygen and other gases that make up our atmosphere. The amount of water vapor in the air is expressed as relative humidity and as the dew point. Well, relative humidity relates to the actual water vapor that is or could be present in the atmosphere. Now, here is a weather fact. Relative humidity, by definition, is relative. Relative humidity relates to the actual water vapor to that which could be present. This graphic shows how relative humidity works. Here we have three containers each filled with air. At a lower temperature, you can only pack in so much water or water vapor, in this case shown by the blue specks. As the temperature increases, you can see the container, same size, we can pack in a little bit more water vapor, and as the temperature becomes very warm, we can substantially increase the amount of water vapor that can fit into a parcel of air. Another weather fact, the dew point is that temperature to which air has to be cooled to become saturated by water vapor already present in the air. Now check this out. Here are three examples with the dew point at 37 degrees Fahrenheit with a temperature of 55 degrees Fahrenheit and a dew point of 37 degrees. You can see a nice wide dew point spread with a relative humidity of about 50%. Now for this parcel of air, we can still pack in some more water vapor at this temperature. This is actual water vapor present. This is how much more we can hold. We can still pack in another 50% of water vapor at this temperature. Now, as we cool our air parcel down to 44 degrees Fahrenheit, same size container, but now we're at 75% relative humidity. Now, as we cool that air mass even more, we take the air mass down to the dew point temperature. They're both 37 degrees. It's saturated. Some type of cloud, precipitation, or condensation is going to occur. Our parcel of atmosphere is saturated with water vapor. The conclusion is that warm air has the capacity to hold more water vapor than cooler air. Now, here's a little weather wisdom. The temperature and dew point spread is very important in anticipating fog. As the temperature and dew point spread decreases, or comes closer together, that relative humidity is going to increase at 100% and fog will form. Now, pilots should be aware when the dew point temperature spread is less than 5 degrees, anticipate such an event as fog. Here are more weather facts. Water vapor is always present in the atmosphere and can be found in one of three states. It can be a gas, a liquid, or a solid. At 100% humidity, fog will form. As water changes from one state to another, an exchange of heat or energy occurs. Energy is contained in latent heat. A change of state is the process of latent heat exchange. A change of state by vaporization, condensation, sublimation, melting and freezing is called a change through the process of latent heat exchange. As water changes from one state to another, an exchange of heat occurs and energy is gained and released. Now, here are the states of water. Here is water in a gaseous form. It's in a cloud. Through condensation, energy can be released to make a change by going from a gas into a liquid. Still releasing more energy through freezing, it becomes a solid like a snowflake or it can sublimate directly, releasing energy to change into a snowflake. Here is the reverse effect. It can also gain energy through latent heat exchange by changing from a solid to a liquid, by melting and then from a liquid through evaporation into a gas, or it can directly sublimate back to a gas. Heat is always gained or lost through a change of state.
Now here's another important bit of weather wisdom. Liquid water droplets often persist and exist at temperatures much colder than zero degrees Celsius. They're super cool, and when they impact an object, that impact induces freezing. Freezing rain can result, and that can cause extreme aircraft icing. Supercooled water drops are often abundant in cumulus clouds, ranging between zero and negative 15 degrees Celsius. Remember, frost forms in much the same way as dew. The difference here is the dew point of the surrounding air, and that is colder than freezing. Now, water vapor then sublimates or changes state directly as ice crystals or frost, rather than condensing as dew. Let's review. Clouds and visible moisture are parcels of air which have reached 100% humidity. They are saturated. Cooling a parcel of air increases its relative humidity. A parcel of air has to be cooled to its dew point to become a cloud. Time once again for another test question. This one, what is meant by the term dew point? Again, you have three choices. And your answer is C, dew point is the temperature to which air must be cooled to be saturated. Very good. All right, let's move along to another topic now. This time out, atmospheric stability. Join your instructor in the classroom for that topic. Ever wonder how clouds form? A parcel of air has to be cooled and reach its saturation point and then clouds will form. And how does that cooling occur? There are basically only three ways this happens. Lifting action causes air to cool. If this air mass were lifted by terrain, for example, clouds would form. If warm air is moved over a cooler surface like this, clouds can form. Notice these clouds have nice flat bases, stratus clouds. Clouds will also form due to radiation cooling, which is the ground cooling at night. This will often produce very flat, low clouds, typically stratus or in a lot of cases, fog. You can estimate heights of clouds knowing the dew point and temperature for a given location. The dry adiabatic lapse rate is 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit per thousand feet. The dew point lapse rate is one degree Fahrenheit per thousand feet. The temperature and the dew point converge at about 4.4 degrees per thousand feet. Use this formula. Subtract the dew point from the temperature, both in Fahrenheit, and divide that by 4.4 times 1,000. Here's an example. In this case, the temperature is 76 degrees. The dew point is 40 degrees. 76 minus 40 equals 36. Divide this by 4.4, and that equals 8.2. Multiply this by 1,000, and you get roughly 8,200 feet. So the cloud base is about 8,200 feet. What makes an air mass stable or unstable, and how does that affect your flying? Well, check out this balloon. Now, all you have to do is think of this balloon as simply an enclosed parcel of air. As this balloon or parcel of air rises up in the atmosphere, it's going to expand because there's less pressure or force being put on that balloon at higher altitudes due to decreased pressure. Anytime air rises, it's going to expand and cool. It's a simple principle of physics. The average lapse rate the air parcel is going to cool is about two degrees Celsius per thousand foot gain in altitude. Look at this example. As air expands and rises, it's going to cool, and as air descends in the atmosphere, it's going to warm up. Now, these changes are adiabatic, meaning no heat is removed or added from that parcel of air. The adiabatic rate of change of temperature is virtually fixed in unsaturated or a dry air parcel. Here are more weather facts. As air expands and rises, it cools. As air descends, it compresses and warms. These changes are adiabatic, so that means no heat is removed or added.
The adiabatic rate of change of temperature is virtually fixed in unsaturated or a dry air parcel. The adiabatic rate of change of temperature varies in saturated air. Latent heat is released through condensation, which offsets the expansion cooling process. The saturated adiabatic rate of cooling is lower than the dry adiabatic rate. Air full of water vapor is going to cool at a slower rate than a dry parcel of air will. The adiabatic rate of change of temperature varies in saturated or wet air because latent heat is released through condensation, which then partially offsets the expansion cooling process. The saturated adiabatic rate of cooling is lower than the dry adiabatic rate. In other words, air full of water vapor is going to cool at a lower or slower rate than a dry parcel of air will. Let's talk about adiabatic lapse rates. Here we have three balloons all at the bottom of the atmosphere. Three enclosed parcels of air. Now, if we take a look at this first parcel of air, instantaneously fly it all the way up to 5,000 feet, and you'll notice the temperature inside our parcel of air is 16 degrees Celsius. But outside is 13 degrees. It's warmer than the outside air. It's an unstable or rapidly rising parcel of air. Now, in this example, we have a stable lapse rate. We take our balloon from the surface up to 5,000 feet, just like that, and notice our parcel of air is at 16 degrees Celsius. But the outside air is warmer. It's 18 degrees Celsius. This is cooler and it's denser. It's going to descend. It's a stable lapse rate. Neutral stability looks like this. We take our balloon from the surface up to 5,000 feet, in a matter of a couple seconds, and we have the same temperature right here. 16 and 16 is a neutrally buoyant parcel of air. Here are more weather wisdoms. An air mass temperature which decreases rapidly with altitude favors instability. An air mass temperature which changes little with altitude tends to be stable. The saturated adiabatic rate of cooling is lower than the dry adiabatic rate. An air mass temperature which increases in altitude tends to be very stable. Here are more weather facts. The lapse rate is the rate of change in the temperature with the change in altitude. Lapse rate varies from dry air of about 3 degrees Celsius per thousand feet to moist adiabatic lapse rates of about 1.5 degrees Celsius per thousand feet. This standard lapse rate is 2 degrees Celsius with a thousand foot altitude gain. An unstable air is an air mass that cools more rapidly than 2 degrees Celsius for each 1,000 foot altitude gain. This graphic depicts the lapse rates. This is a standard lapse rate, and as you can see, temperature cools with height, great visibility, and a few fair weather cumulus clouds out there, but you know, all in all, good VFR flying. Just the opposite is true when you have a temperature inversion. A temperature inversion occurs when air temperature does not cool with height. Rather, the atmosphere warms up with altitude. At the top of the inversion, it begins to cool. This inversion layer greatly reduces visibility, maybe because of some fog, low-lying clouds or stratus, or even pollutants. It's a great ride. You just can't see where you're going. Now, here's another example of stability. In the early morning hours, the air is typically very stable. Temperatures are cool at the surface and also aloft. By midday, as the atmosphere begins to heat up, that warm air rises. It creates an unstable condition and you get a bumpy ride. Now, just the opposite occurs in the evening hours, as you can see. Temperatures cool aloft and at the surface, it's a nice smooth ride again. Welcome back. Time once again for another review question. This time, what feature is associated with a temperature inversion? What feature, A, B, or C? Your answer is A. A temperature inversion occurs when the temperature increases with altitude. A stable layer of air is characterized by warmer air lying above colder air. With an inversion, the layer is stable and convection is suppressed. All right, let's move right along another topic and for you this time in the classroom clouds back to Natasha let's look up and talk about clouds 
Clouds are divided into four families according to their height range. There are low clouds, middle clouds, high clouds, and clouds with vertical development. Check this out. Take a look at these clouds. We have low clouds, middle clouds, high clouds, and clouds with vertical development. Now here's a depiction of the various cloud types. We have your cumulonimbus cirrus, altostratus, stratocumulus, cirrocumulus, altocumulus, and stratus clouds. I started out in aviation, so I've always been looking at the clouds as a pilot and then later as a meteorologist. What I've determined, and it's fairly easy to tell, if you look at the vertical development of the clouds, how high that cloud is going up in the atmosphere. If it has big vertical development, it obviously means that you have a very unstable atmosphere, which means you're going to have a fairly rough ride and could be some thunderstorm issues. If those clouds are obviously laying down flat, or stratus clouds that we call them, typically means you'll have a smooth ride but could have poor visibility. The high clouds here, cirrostratus clouds. Stratus, they're flat, cirrus because they're very high up in the atmosphere. Typically, they're made up of super cooled water droplets that are now ice. They're way up in the sky, about 20,000 feet. Nice blue sky, but you begin to see these wispy horsetail shaped clouds. They're very thin, and they tell you that you're looking at a weather change about 36 to 48 hours from your present time. Now, here are cirrocumulus clouds. A little bit of heaping going on out there, a little thicker cloud pattern. They're still high clouds with bases right about 20,000 feet. Now, here are middle to high clouds, alto stratus clouds, 6,500 to 20,000 feet above the ground. Nice flat base clouds. They are stratus clouds, but they're also middle clouds. We move into middle clouds or the alto cumulus between about 6,500 to about 20,000 feet for the bases. And you can notice right here, they're also known as fair weather cues. Nice day out there with a the little bit of vertical development. Might be a little bumpy below this cloud, but very smooth above it. Now here are interesting middle to high clouds. These are alto cumulus lenticulars, standing lenticular clouds, or lens-shaped clouds. Very well defined. You see them over mountain peaks, and they're also telling you one more thing. They range from 6,500 to 20,000 feet. It's very windy at this level in the atmosphere. It's going to be a very bumpy ride, and if you're on the leeward side of a mountain range and you're seeing an alto cumulus standing lenticular cloud, watch out. Now into the lower clouds, these are the stratus clouds, and these are cumulus, so a little bit of definition to them, but about 6,500 feet for strato -cues. Here are more low clouds. This is just a plain old stratus base right here, about 6,500 feet. But look at this, virtually no definition to cloud bases at all. Nice flat stratus cloud. These are vertical development clouds. Here are cumulus or the beginning of our heap clouds. They range from 6,500 to 20,000 feet. Notice it kind of looks like mashed potatoes all kind of heaped up in a bowl. Flat bases. Now here are cumulonimbus, very flat down here at the base, giving you an awful lot of vertical development up to 45,000 feet. They indicate a very unstable atmosphere, an awful lot of moisture in here, up and down movement, and a very rough ride. Towering cumulus, look at this, 45,000 feet in height for their tops, and in some cases, much higher than this. Even airliners avoid this stuff. A huge amount of water vapor going up and down, condensing and freezing and becoming liquid again. Thunderstorms are in here. Ice, hail, all kinds of problems. Avoid these. Give them a very wide berth. And even more of a wide berth when you get towering cumulonimbus. Towering cumulonimbus is the Greek water god. These are chuck full of water and they're going to be thunderstorm makers and can potentially become tornado makers as well. 45,000 feet tops, a lot of water in them, very rough ride. Steer clear of these clouds. We'll cover fog next. Fog forms much the same as clouds. When cloud bases are less than 50 feet AGL, they are officially fog. Fog that is less than 20 feet thick is called ground fog. Fog is a surface base cloud restricting visibility and composed of either water droplets or ice crystals. 
As we talked about earlier, fog may form by cooling the air to its dew point or by adding moisture to the air near the ground. A small temperature dew point spread is the essential for the formation of fog. A fog is classified by the way it forms. There is advection fog, radiation fog, upslope fog, precipitation or drizzle induced fog, and steam fog. Advection fog, warm air moves over a cooler surface. It requires a sea breeze. It's common along the coastline where a warmer air mass coming perhaps off of a warm body of water moves over cooler land and the fog forms. Classic Pacific Coast or Atlantic Coast fog conditions even in the Gulf Coast as well. Radiation fog. This is found in most low-lying areas during calm, clear, cool nights, often in river valleys where the air is cool, it's moist, it's very abundant, and you get this radiation fog forming. It dissipates once the sun pops up and things begin to warm. Upslope fog requires very moist, stable air mass. It's forced uphill. Up that landmass, it can form in moderate and strong winds and often under cloudy skies as well. Precipitation or drizzle induced fog is most commonly associated with frontal activity and is formed by relatively warm drizzle or rain falling through cooler air. This fog is especially critical because it occurs in the proximity of precipitation and other possible hazards such as icing, turbulence, and thunderstorms. Steam fog, cold air over warmer water. It rises upward and almost resembles smoke coming off the water. All right, this time we have a couple of review questions for you. The first, standing lenticular clouds in mountainous areas indicate which of these three? Your answer C, standing lenticular altocumulus clouds are formed on the crests of waves created by barriers to the wind flow. The clouds show little movement, hence the name standing. However, wind can be quite strong blowing through such clouds. The presence of these clouds is a good indication of very strong turbulence and should be avoided. Okay, let's take the next question here. What types of fog depend upon wind in order to exist? Your answer here, C. Advection fog forms when moist air moves over cloud, rather colder ground or water. Upslope fog forms as a result of moist, stable air being cooled adiabatically as it moves up sloping terrain. Okay, very good. Let's tackle another topic. Air masses. Join Natasha in the classroom. So far, we've talked about fog, clouds, their types and characteristics, stable and unstable air. We'll talk about how this all fits into the big picture of air mass weather. An air mass is quite simply a big uniform mass of atmosphere that takes on the characteristics of its source region. In this case, its source region is up over Canada and the northern part of the U.S. There are various types of source regions for various types of air masses. Let's go over a few of them which are characteristic of North America. First, there is the marine polar or cool air mass that influences much of the weather here in the Pacific Northwest. The maritime or marine polar air mass influences most of the eastern seaboard all the way from Maine down as far as portions of Pennsylvania, even at times in sections of Kentucky and Tennessee. There is a cold continental polar air mass right here. It's a drier air mass, polar meaning cool. Next is the marine tropical air mass. It's warm and moist. The marine tropical or warm moist air influences much of California and portions of southern Nevada. A marine tropical air mass or a warm moist air mass influences all of Florida, much of Georgia, the Gulf Coast, and Baja Mexico. Finally, there is the continental dry tropical or a very warm air mass. This is typical to Arizona, New Mexico, and portions of Texas. Air masses can be modified. Temperature and moisture can be added or removed from an air mass. They can be sped up or slowed down. An air mass can be warmed or cooled from below, and water vapor can be added or removed from an air mass. 
Here's an example of modifying an air mass. We'll start out with a nice, dry, stable, cool continental or CP air mass. It comes in and out of Canada. This air mass rolls across the Great Lakes. And it's a large body of water, and water tends to hold in heat more than land does. And as that water evaporates, it rises up. It makes this air mass moist and unstable. So it is a moist, unstable air mass, and this creates precipitation. It causes snow in much of the southeast. It gives the nice big Appalachian Mountain snow events we have in the winter months. Now here's an example of cooling an air mass from below. Here is a warm tropical air mass coming up off the Pacific Ocean. Nice wet air, it's warm, buoyant air, and then it runs across a cooler land mass here in the Sacramento and San Joaquin Valley of California. So this air mass is cooled from below, and this allows for large areas of low clouds and fog, low stratus type clouds to reach out up and down the entire length of the valley and bring fog into the Bay Area. Air masses can be stable and unstable. With an unstable air mass, you can expect cumuliform clouds, those nice puffy heat type clouds like mashed potatoes. You'll experience showery precipitation, not continuous, but showery and a very bumpy ride with good visibility. Now, for a stable air mass, it's the opposite. You'll see stratiform clouds. Flat clouds with extensive areas of fog and continuous but not heavy precipitation. The air will be smooth, providing a nice ride, but you're going to pay for it with poor visibility, lots of smoke and haze. And again, the ride's great, but you can't see a whole lot. Okay, let's take a break once again for a review question. A stable air mass is most likely to have which characteristic? Which of these three? Your answer is C. Stable air mass equals smooth air, but poor visibility. Okay, let's go back to the classroom and another topic here. Fronts. Your instructor, please. Let's talk about weather fronts. You hear about these all the time on TV and radio. They're classified by types. There are cold fronts, warm fronts, stationary fronts, and occluded fronts. And you can see the fronts depicted here. You have the cold front, the warm front, stationary front, and occluded front. Now here's a bit of weather wisdom. A front is simply a boundary line between two masses of cold air or warm air on each side of this front. That's all it is. It's a boundary line between two air masses. The easiest and most recognized way to look for a frontal band Look for a change in temperature and a change in dew point. Also, watch for a change in wind speed and wind direction. A front lies in a pressure trough, and pressure generally is higher in the cooler air and lower in the warmer air. Here's a cold front with a boundary line with warmer air ahead of it. Here's the cold, drier air all moving off in this direction. Here is the typical weather you can expect in a cold front. You can see the see the showery activity along with the thunderstorms and the uprising air. Now, here's what to look for with a cold front passage. Prior to the passage, look for cirrus, towering cumulus, cumulonimbus clouds, and look for some showers. Visibility will be fair to hazy. The winds will be out of the south-southwest. The temperature out ahead of this cold front passage will be warm. The dew point will be high warmer, moist air, and the barometer will be falling. Now, during passage of a cold front, here's how things change. We have towering cumulus clouds and cumulonimbus clouds. The precipitation will be heavy showers resulting in poor visibility. And the winds will be variable and gusty because the frontal passage will result in a change in direction. The temperature becomes suddenly cooler prior to cold front passage. The dew point will drop and the bottom of the barometer will begin to go up. After the passage, look for cumulus or heaped type clouds. Precipitation will be light, a little bit of a showery activity, visibility suddenly improves, and the winds have gone from south southwest to north northwest after the passage. The temperature is cooler, the dew point keeps on dropping, and that barometer keeps on rising. 
Now here's a warm front. Note the warm air mass sloping over the cold, dry air and overtaking it. Here is the expected weather. You can see snowflakes falling from above. You have alto stratus and nimbo stratus clouds. Now check out this table. Prior to a warm front passage, look for cirrus and stratus clouds and some fog. So there's some flat cloud decks. Precipitation, moderate rains a possibility, drizzle and sleet and some snow prior to passage. The visibility will be poor. The winds prior to passage out of the south southeast, temperatures cold to cool. The dew point will begin to rise and the barometer is going to drop. Now during a passage of a warm front, look for stratiform clouds, drizzle and maybe nothing as far as precipitation goes. Visibility a little bit better but still on the poor side. The winds will be variable, the temperature begins to rise. Now remember, we're going through a warm front passage. The dew point will hold and the barometer will also begin to hold. Now after passage of our warm front, we're going to look for some stratocumulus clouds right here. Maybe a few cumulonimbus rain or some showery precipitation. And that's just a maybe. Visibility fair and haze, got a warm front passage. The winds are now out of the south southwest. The temperature will be warm because we've had a warmer air mass move on through. The dew point will rise and then it's going to hold and then the barometer will rise and then begin to fall after that frontal passage. An occluded front is simply two frontal systems coming together. Note how the cold front and warm front are joined. Now here are the characteristics of a cold front occlusion. Colder air being denser and heavier is digging under this warmer, lighter air. And now our air mass is moving up in one direction here. So our warm front and cold front are being moved in the same direction, but the colder front being denser and heavier travels more rapidly than the lighter warm front. Now here are the cloud decks to look for. Nimbostratus, a rather flat type of cloud and our precipitation is going to be light, occasionally on the heavy side. Now temperature changes. We will go from some cool air to some very cold air back in behind of our cold front occlusion. Now with a warm front occlusion, it's a different story. In this case, we have a cold and warm front. Note how the cold front is rising above the warm front. We get embedded cumulonimbus clouds, we get nimbostratus, we get altostratus, we have warm air that is rising, it is buoyant, and as that air rises, it becomes unstable, and you get this type of cloud pattern. It's indicative of very bad weather and a bumpy ride. Temperatures will go from cold air and some fog and stratus to cooler air back and behind that warm front occlusion. Now check out this table. These are some characteristics to go with an occluded front. Clouds prior to passage, cirrus and stratiform. Precipitation can be light to heavy, depending on whether it's a cold front or a warm front occlusion. Visibility will be poor. The wind will be out of the southeast to south. Temperature going from cold to cool. Dew point will hold steady. And the barometer prior to passage will be on the falling side. Now during passage, our clouds will be nimbostratus, towering cumulus and cumulonimbus. Lots of violent weather, lots of precipitation, light to heavy, visibility still poor, the wind variable because we're now going through our frontal passage. Temperature will go cold and of course with our cold front occlusion it's going to drop. With our warm front occlusion that temperature will bring in warmer air so it will tend to rise. Dew point will drop a little bit and the barometer will begin to stabilize. Now, after passage of our occluded front, look for cloud cover to include some nimbostratus. I'll get to the right side of the map here for you. And of course, nimbostratus and perhaps some of the altostratus as well. Precipitation, light to moderate at times. A visibility will improve and pass the frontal passage. Now, here's a look at the winds will be out of the west to northwest. Temperatures with our cold front occlusion will be colder and with a warm front occlusion, it's going to be a bit milder. The dew point will rise, then hold steady. The pressure now with the cold occlusion will drop. With the warm front occlusion, it's going to rise. With operating IFR, 
Are you still concerned if there's a little moisture in the air, just other than ice? But well, yeah, because you're going to want to know what you have as far as type of precipitation. Is it going to be rain? Is it going to be snow? Also, if you're flying into IFR, how long is that flight going to be in actual IFR conditions? What kind of clouds are you going to be going into? And then on your letdown procedure, how low are those clouds going to be? And will you be encountering any kind of fog that may require you to have a, an alternate airport further away than your original destination? A cold front is depicted with these little barbs you can see right here. Now, the way the barbs are pointed indicate which way the front is moving. Out ahead of a cold front, we have warmer air, and back and behind, we have, of course, colder air. A warm front is depicted by little half circles. You can see them right here. But again, which way the little half circles are pointed indicates which way the front is moving. Out ahead of a warm front, we have colder air, and back and behind it, we have warmer air. For front occlusion, we have that marriage of a warm front and cold front. And here we have our half circle, our barb, and then another half circle. Now, out of our frontal occlusion, colder air down here, cooler air back and behind the front, and then also out ahead of our frontal occlusion, we have warm air aloft. Now, for the stationary front, neither front is making any forward progress. So basically, what we have are colder air moving in this direction, but it's been stopped in its tracks by our warm front right here going in the opposite direction. Now, look for air like this back in behind the front. Also, look for direction of movement. Here we have colder air with high pressure turning clockwise behind our stationary front, and we have warmer air with lower pressure turning counterclockwise back in behind. Frontolysis is the end of a front. Here we have a stationary front. It's our boundary line between the two air masses colder air and warmer air, and as this boundary line begins to weaken, these two areas of air pull apart. Our front becomes a little trough. That's indicated right here by this dashed line. And then as the two air masses become even weaker, you can see nothing exists here at all. So there is no trough. It becomes two widely separated air masses. For frontogenesis, or the birth of a front, we have our two source regions, warmer air, colder air that draws closer together so our boundary line is beginning to form right here. Here is a stationary front. The warm air mass, the cold air mass, both of them relatively equal in strength, so no front making any progress on each other. Frontogenesis and frontolysis is simply the birth and death of a front. In this case, it's a stationary front. Some very good information covered on that topic. Now, another FAA review question. Which weather phenomenon is always associated with the passage of a frontal system? Which of these three? And your answer here is A. Wind always changes across a front. Wind discontinuity may be in direction, in speed, or in both. Temperature and humidity also may change. Okay, let's tackle yet another topic here. This time out. Thunderstorms. Back to your classroom and your instructor. Okay, let's talk about thunderstorms now. Pilots should avoid thunderstorms by careful pre-flight weather briefings and planning. Basically, just never fly into a thunderstorm. Here's what to look for. The tops of these monsters reach up to 60,000 feet. That's twice the height an airliner typically flies. There are clouds with extensive vertical development. The presence of cumulonimbus mammatus clouds up at the bases indicate the probability of thunderstorm activity. Try to get out of this as soon as possible. Now There are three stages to a thunderstorm. The cumulus stage, the mature stage, and the dissipating stage. Now, in this abstract, watch for the examples of the three stages and how they typically manifest themselves, beginning with the cumulus stage. Then it changes into the mature stage. Then, finally, the dissipating stage. 
Now the three stages shown here illustrate the vertical air movement. There are lots of updrafts going on, also the beginning of some downdrafts with some heavy precipitation. And of course, you'll notice right here a little anvil forming on our cloud, indicating which way the upper level winds are going. We also see lots of violent precipitation, hail, thunder, lightning. Hail can be the size of golf balls, and that can cause some serious structural damage to even the largest airplanes. And of course, the last stage is the dissipating stage, or the dying stage of a thunderstorm. Lots of downdrafts in here, a few updrafts still going on, but this storm is now dying off. We'll still see a lot of precipitation going on in these systems. Now, a thunderstorm can be very unpredictable, and the reason for that is they're very short-lived storms. The birth to death of a thunderstorm may be only 45 to perhaps 90 minutes. It makes them very dangerous, very strong storms, and also very difficult to predict. Again, here's what to look for in a thunderstorm. Lots of updraft activity going on with this one. Here we have our highest anvil-shaped cloud indicating storm movement. Down here at lower levels is that colder, dense air now falling out. Ahead of it, this first gust cloud as the storm is moving toward you. And watch for these little rotors or roll clouds right here. They are the start of what can become a tornado. Now, any thoughts on how pilots can judge an appropriate distance from thunderstorm activity, especially when they're operating in IMC. There's some great things that have come out in the last few years. First of all, you can always get a hold of ATC, air traffic control, and they will alert you if there are severe thunderstorms or if there's large thunderstorms in your presence. Obviously, if you're under IFR, you're under positive control. Other things you can have, a lot of airplanes now are having their own onboard radar, both either panel mounted or a lot of the portable systems now that are available can give you near or real time radar imagery showing you where thunderstorm activity may be popping up along your flight. Welcome back to the studio and another FAA review question. During the life cycle of a thunderstorm, which stage is characterized predominantly by downdrafts? Which of these, A, B, or C? Your answer is B, dissipating. Downdrafts characterize the dissipating stage of the thunderstorm cell and the storm dies rapidly. Okay, hey, let's tackle yet another topic. Coming up, turbulence. Join your instructor in your classroom for that topic. It's blue, it's sunny, the flight is smooth, but then all of a sudden you encounter this. Turbulence and perhaps even some wind shear. Here's what to look for and how to avoid it. Now, what do you do when you encounter turbulence? I usually try not to encounter turbulence. <laughs> Stay away. Stay away, exactly. Usually mm -hmm. I'm going to be looking at, uh, you know, before I depart, how rough the, uh, it might be whether the atmosphere is stable or if I've got some kind of a mountain pass to go through. I usually try to stay out of the turbulent weather unless I have to go into it for whatever reason or if I get caught into it. Usually trying to climb above it or get down below it and look at those winds at various levels in the atmosphere. Here we are flying along in the upper atmosphere above these nice cumulus clouds. Almost always smooth, but for most of us, we fly, of course, down below. And that's going to include some turbulence from time to time, and also down below the air current. As they move along, they take on the characteristics of a landmass. In this case, your mountains and valleys, ridges and peaks. And hey, look at this. Here we have our wind. Lower atmosphere flows up this mountain peak, back down the valley. On the back side, you see right here some rotors or some eddy circulations developing. Same thing at even lower levels. Look at this, flying over a valley. Now, in a forested field right here, we fly up and fly down. The air currents in the back side of that forest once again, and a little eddy current. We can see that moving right here. Same thing can happen in a crosswind situation on a landing and takeoff. Here we have runway 24 and this classic crosswind. The wind flows up, hits the side of the hangar, goes up over the roof, then drops back. And here again is our eddy current causing turbulence. Now flying along in the upper atmosphere again, pretty smooth until you come across a situation like this. 
It's classic in the mountain west of the U.S., the Cascades and the Rocky Mountain areas. This is the mountain wave for the Lee wave pattern. It's pretty smooth until you hit the back side of the mountain and the wind direction. And, and then here you have this wave pattern indicating turbulence. Well, to recognize it, look for a lenticular cloud or even further downstream, a rotor cloud. Again, indicating intense turbulence and certainly a bumpy ride. Here we have a strong downdraft or a microburst. We're on takeoff, flying into this headwind. Airspeed is on the increase. At the center of the microburst, we start to fly into the downdraft. As we pass the downdraft, we are experiencing a significant tailwind. As this happens, the wind is increasing and the airspeed is decreasing. You're losing lift and unless you can power out of this, you're going to fly right into the ground. Welcome back for another brief break and a review question. This one, where does wind shear occur? Which of these answers is correct? Your answer this time is C. Wind shear may be associated with either a wind shift or a wind speed gradient at any level in the atmosphere. All right, moving on. Airframe icing is the topic. Join your instructor in the classroom for that topic. Airframe icing is a very serious atmospheric condition. It can bring down anything from a simple single engine airplane to a full size passenger jet. Now let's talk a little about IFR. All right. What are your primary weather concerns when you plan and execute an IFR flight? Number one, ice. If you're flying into actual IFR conditions, are you going to be in company or in going into any icing scenarios? Would that ice be clear ice? Would that ice be rime ice? That's my number one issue if I'm going to be flying IFR. Okay. Ice can form on any exposed surface during flight with visible moisture at or below zero degrees Celsius. Icing increases drag, increases weight, reduces thrust, lift, and aircraft performance. As little as just a half inch of ice can reduce the performance of an airplane by 50%. Supercooled water is the most dangerous ice and can build up to three inches in just five minutes exposure. There are three types of airframe icing. Now first is rime ice. This is a little ram shaped ice pattern and you'll notice that it's rather milky color as well. well. This kind of ice typically forms in stratiform clouds or flat clouds and sometimes it can be precipitation that's already frozen or near freezing and it strikes the wing of the airplane. Not a lot of flow here but it builds upwards and can really cause an awful lot of drag and substantial loss of performance on your aircraft's wing. Next up is clear ice. And here we have a case of water droplets or super cooled water droplets forming in cumulus clouds. They strike the wing, flow back over and keep building up. This adds a lot of weight. It's a clear color and also adds weight and inhibits wing and aircraft performance. Finally, there's mixed icing, which can form in either cumulus or stratus type clouds. And here is that flow pattern associated with clear icing and the milky color and the very rough edges associated with a rime ice condition. Frost is a variation on ice. Frost is described as ice deposits formed by sublimation on a surface when the temperature of the collecting surface is at or below the dew point or the adjacent air and the dew point is below freezing. Frost causes early airflow separation on an airfoil, resulting in a loss of lift. Therefore, all frost should be removed from the lifting surfaces of an airplane before flight, or it may prevent the airplane from becoming airborne. Time for another FAA review question, this on aircraft icing. 
In which environment is aircraft structural icing most likely to have the highest accumulation rate? Which environment, A, B, or C? The answer in this case is C, freezing rain, gives you the most likely and the highest accumulation rate of icing. All right, our final topic in this lesson will be covered by Natasha Jetstream. Back to the classroom. Our final area of discussion covers the high altitude weather in the jet stream. Most general aviation pilots will not fly into the jet stream, but the jet, even though it's high up in the atmosphere, does affect the weather below. What are some of the global weather patterns that pilots should be on the alert for? The thing I keep my eye on the most is the upper level winds or the jet stream. The jet stream is simply the steering currents in the atmosphere. And if you look at the jet stream and where that's going, it's either going to be pulling or it's going to be pushing the lower level atmosphere, which contains the clouds and the moisture. And that's going to be containing your weather. So where the jet stream goes, the lower level atmosphere, which contains all the moisture, the warm air and the cold air and most of the cloud cover, will be following a few hours behind. Here's how the jet stream works. The jet core is about 40,000 feet up in the atmosphere, but the closer you move toward the polar tropopause, the lower the jet will occur in the atmosphere. Consequently, the further south you travel towards the warmer air and the tropical tropopause, the higher up in the jet stream you're going to find the core. The jet stream core width can average anywhere from 100 to 400 miles. The core height is typically anywhere from about 3,000 to 7,000 feet in the jet stream itself. The actual river in the atmosphere can be anywhere from a few hundred miles long to upwards of 1,000 to 3,000 miles in length. There can be one or two jet streams at a time. Here is a northern branch and a weaker southern branch of the jet stream. What weather factors help you decide whether you'll fly through the weather, select an altitude above it, or make the no-go decision. I'm going to be looking at uh, my in-route forecast. I'm going to be looking at a number of things. What the weather is going to be at my destination, what the forecast weather is going to be within three or four or five hours of my destination. Also in route, if I'm going to be encountering conditions that I don't like, whether it's visibility, winds, or turbulence, can I plot my way around that? Can I go to the north, south, east, or the west around that? And also, is it just better to maybe sit on the ground and wait things out? Not above doing that, you know, maybe eight, ten hours, or put the entire flight off 24 hours if I have to until weather phenomena moves through the area. This is great information, especially meteorologist, pilot. You're getting some good info here. One final question yes. for you, Gabe. What kind of weather detection equipment do you use in an IFR mission? IFR mission, I'm going to be using a radar, okay. a portable radar set up in the aircraft like uh, a Garmin system uh, on board the airplane using that. I'll also be talking with ATC, air traffic control. Sure. Are they encountering along the line from other pilots giving pilot reports back in inclement weather, uh, icing, turbulence, rain or fog? Does it change much if you're operating in VFR? changes as far as you don't have that positive control that you would have if you are flying IFR as opposed to VFR. If you're flying IFR, you have positive control with ATC. If you're flying VFR, you don't have that same. Outstanding. Well, there you have it. Terrific information from Dave Seleski, a guy who should know, meteorologist <laughs> and hope. pilot, your information on weather. Thanks again for yep. joining us, Dave. Truly a great job, Natasha. Appreciate it. Now, I certainly understand better how uh, weather concepts apply to pilots in their pre-flight and in-flight decision making and certainly it applies to everyday life as well. Now moving on, uh, how do pilots gather this information and how do they use it? Well, if there's a process to it. We're going to learn how to apply that weather information all in lesson two.